right. Well, good morning, everyone. This is Jim Keddy with Children Now, and uh, welcome to the School Budgets and Equity, What Do Parents and Community Groups Need to Know webinar. This is a webinar presented by Children Now and the Education Trust West. Uh, we're going to be with you for the uh, next hour. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and um, get started, and uh, thank you again for joining us this morning. Uh, the presenters in this webinar will be myself, Jim Keddy, here at Children Now, my colleague, Rob Manwaring, and then two of our partners from the Education Trust West, Carrie Hanel, who is the Deputy Director over Research, and Raquel Simmental, who is the Director of External Relations and Communications. In terms of the kind of rules of engagement for the webinar, uh, we will have a question and answer segment at the very end about the last 10 minutes, assuming we move quickly through these slides in the hour that we have. Okay, so in today's presentation, as we look at the local control funding formula, our particular interest is around um, budgets. So we're not going to be spending time on strategy and issues or populations as much as we're going to be just help, wanting to help parents and community groups look at um, uh, how to get greater clarity and transparency around where LCFF dollars are going in local districts. So you may be working in your own community and have a particular focus on English language learners, or you may be working focused on services for, for uh, foster youth, or just more generally on uh, how to bring greater supports to low-income students. This w webinar will be relevant to all of that work because we're really trying to uh, get focused on, uh, on, on budgets and transparency and LCFF funding. Uh, we'll start off uh, talking about the overarching themes for the webinar. Then we decided to kind of give you a big picture view of uh, what's happening with uh, school funding in California. Where are we at compared to other states? Uh, what's been going on over the last number of years with school funding? Then uh, my uh, colleagues at Education, Education Trust West will help drill down on what they're seeing with uh, in the LCAPs, the Local Control Accountability Plans, and how that relates to equity, supplemental concentration funding. Next, we'll provide you with some recommendations on moving forward and, and uh, working with your districts around um, uh, transparency uh, when it comes to spending and budgets. And then finally, we'll do some uh, questions and answers. Uh, the, our organization, Children Now, in partnership with Education Trust West and with the California Association of School Business Officials, also known as CASBO, we've been working together on a, a project about local control funding formula budget transparency. And uh, in, a, in this partnership, it's enabled us to work both with community groups and parents and advocates, as well as with school business officials who make up the uh, California Association of School Business Officials. And so we're trying to work, look at this whole question of uh, budget transparency from, from two points of view. One is uh, the parent and community point of view, and then also how can our partnership support districts as district staff are uh, seeking to learn how to engage communities in, uh, around the LCFF conversation and also working to become more transparent. So we have kind of a dual track that we've been working on together of the three organizations. Here are some of the overarching themes we'll explore today. We'll talk about what are the competing pressures districts face when it comes to allocating LCFF funds. We'll look at the timeline around how districts make decisions on budgets and LCFF. We'll look, on a, we'll look at this particular issue of funding around one-time funds, what's happening with Prop 98 this year and school funding in the state budget. We'll look forward toward on the horizon with uh, what's coming in terms of changes to the uh, LCAP template and this, uh, what's evolving with the LCFF evaluation rubric and accountability. And then finally, of course, the big theme, which is how can uh, local advocates uh, push for greater transparency and, and increase spending on our highest need uh, students. 
Okay, so we're going to start off now with this overview on uh, where we're at with school funding, big picture. And I'm going to turn this over to my colleague, Rob Manwaring. Thanks, Jim. Um, moving to the next slide. Uh, so, so just wanted to start off with a big picture setting um, to, to give you a sense of where California is relative to other states and, and what that means at the local level. Um, so big picture, California spends less money than other states do. Um, we're about $1,900 per pupil less, and that puts us at 42nd in the country. Um, part of this is because we spend less of our income on schools than other states do. So we're a relatively wealthy state, and yet at the same time, we spend uh, less on schools, even though our government in total is larger than in other states. Um, at the same time, we have some of the highest paid teachers in the country, in part because of the cost of living in this state. So when you combine uh, less spending and higher costs for teachers, um, it really starts to define the resources that are available at our school. And so basically what it means is that there are just basically less adults in California schools than in basically every other state. We rank last in the number of teachers per student. We rank last in counselors and librarians and are 46 in administrators. Um, and just to put this in context, California has 42,000 less teachers than the state of Texas has and yet California serves 1.4 million more students. So you really get a sense of the lack of adult presence in our schools and the direct impact that that has on the education that each and every student receives. Another big theme that's going on in our state is just the, the significant impact that the Great Recession had on our funding. School districts um, are basically just getting back with their head above water for the types of cuts that they, they experienced. Now, obviously, this is going to vary district by district, but in general, as a state, most districts have been able to recover from the Great Recession, but that means that they may not have yet had the opportunity to invest in the types of programs that you're advocating for. And so when you get that context of, like, they've recovered from the recession, and now it's time to really focus on strengthening programs. Hey, Rob, before we leave yeah. this, can you talk a little bit about what you saw happening with school districts during the recession? Like, what were the kinds of budget dynamics that were going on during that time? Sure. Uh, districts had to make, to, to some extent, they had to make really harsh decisions. Some of the biggest things that they had to do is obviously there were, there were cuts in staffing. There was a shortening of the school year in many districts and a whole bunch of uses of one-time funds and, and reserves and, 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 and sort of gamesmanship to shift costs to the future. So, so a lot of what districts have been doing over the last couple of budgets is, was often framed by digging themselves out of the holes that they created. You know, there's a state watch list of, of districts that, that the state has said, you know, there's a really a fiscal problem going on in, the, in, in this specific district. That list was almost up to 200 of the 1,000 districts that we have uh, at the height of the recession. It's now down to just 20 districts that, that the state is really concerned about the fiscal situation that they're in. So districts have really recovered. But unfortunately, what it's meant is over the last couple of years in these initial LCAPs, um, a whole lot of money was just going to riding the ship and less into actually investing in low-income kids. And that may have led to, at your local level, potentially some gamesmanship in how to use LCFS supplemental and concentration dollars and were those uses really targeted at the kids with the greatest need. And then in trying to move into what's happening right now this spring and the timing of the budget, basically there's a really big milestone coming on Friday um, when the governor will release his update on where is the state's economy and what is his proposed funding level for education heading into the next school year. So that will come out on Friday and you'll probably see news clippings around that that should give you a pretty quick sense of of how things are going. Basically, education funding is driven by something called Proposition 98, and it, in its simplest terms, sets aside a specific set of the state budget 
that will be spent on either K-12 schools or community colleges. It's it's some bizarre formulas, but and does weird things sometimes. What we're expecting in May is probably very similar to what the governor's proposal was in January. While there are some changes in the state's economy overall, isn't in as good a shape as it was. Um, revenues are coming into the state are down about a billion dollars from what was expected in January, um, but it's going to have very little impact on school funding. What I would expect to see is around $2.8 billion in LCFF funding. And to try and get what, what that means at the local context, um, I've, I've set a link on this page that will send you to the Department of Education's website. And they have something called the LCFF snapshot that provides basic information on what's going on in a particular district. Um, on that page, you can look at something called your remaining LCFF need, and this is really the gap to fully implementing LCFF. Uh, the state is, has at least signaled that it's going to close about half of that gap. So you can get your local context by simply going to that page and finding the remaining need and dividing it in half, and that'll give you a sense of the resources that your district will have above what it has in the current year's budget. In addition to these ongoing monies, school districts will receive a whole bunch of one-time monies. These are mainly related to state-mandated things that a district has done in the past that they haven't gotten reimbursed for. The state has basically an IOU with school districts, and they're now going to repay a portion of it. And it, what it translates into is $214 per pupil. So you can quickly figure out what your district's getting in one-time funds. And often, these one-time funds because they're not specifically programmed for teacher salary increases or the ongoing cost of the district, they create often the opportunity to leverage those one-time funds to meet specific needs that your organization is seeking. Um, another key decision point that's on the horizon is whether something called Proposition 30 gets reauthorized in November. Now, Proposition 30 was uh, a temporary tax that was put in place in, in Governor Brown's first term. And it basically, uh, the component that's up for reauthorization is a tax on high income earners. Um, and it generates about three to four billion dollars a year for schools. Um, and so it's really important that this gets reauthorized. And absent reauthorization, K-12 funding moving forward is likely to head into, uh, you know, a flat funding or slightly declining funding, um, and you're going to have cuts back on the table and some real challenges. So this is a key milestone will be what happens in the fall and whether we're able to reauthorize Prop 30. And, and one last slide I wanted to go through was just um, an, important, an important thing to, to figure out as you're trying to engage in your local LCAP process is what is the context going on in your district? And here are some key questions that really help, help set the tone for that. So first is, what sort of restorations were needed for cuts that the district made during the recession? Has the district addressed any sort of structural budget problems that it has? So is spending basically in line with the revenues that the district receives? Is your district declining in enrollment? Enrollment changes have a real strong impact on the district. When, when your enrollment is declining, it often means that, you know, the budget is obviously shrinking, but often expenses don't automatically adjust at the same rate. So teachers, uh, their salaries increase slightly each year. And so you have an aging teaching force that's more expensive to maintain, and districts get into challenging situations. So if you're depending upon your enrollment dynamics, that's going to impact what, what the local choices are. You should know that, that built into the system are automatic salary increases for teachers. Each year that a teacher gets additional experience from teaching or has additional education, maybe goes and gets a master's degree, their salaries automatically go up. Um, and so that's a key cost driver is how much are those automatic cost increases going up, similar things with health and pension benefits. In addition, there are agreements on um, salary increases, collective bargaining agreements that the district en enters into. And that also is a key driver in deciding what's still on the table for additional types of programs that you're advocating for. Another key factor is the state has increased the cost that districts must pay for 
contributing to the state pension funds, both for teachers and for other employees. And so that's going to another, be another competing factor and, and a couple of other requirements. So, so it's really understanding what are the cost demands of these different things that are happening automatically that the district has to do before they start and turn their attention to what they want to do. Um, and, and so understanding what's happening with these things that you're competing with, in particular discretionary salary increases, will give you a sense of what's available for new program activities. Yeah, so one of the things you'll be hearing from us as we move forward is, uh, as you work with your districts on LCFF is how can you raise questions and get information to help understand what are some of these competing pressures and then how do you take that into account as you develop an advocacy strategy. I'm now going to be turning this over to my, our partners at the Education Trust West. They've been doing some terrific research on uh, LCAPs and equity and uh, I'll hand it over to them. Okay, thanks Jim. This is Carrie Hanel, Deputy Director with Education Trust West. I think Rob's um, last slide teed up nicely this transition into LCAPs because as advocates are coming to the table with their school districts to talk about what the LCAP, the Local Control and Accountability Plan, will include for the district, the conversation naturally turns to competing cost pressures and it becomes a, a discussion about what we can add, what we need to cut to make that happen, and how do we balance all of this. So at the Ed Trust West, we've been looking at LCAPs for the last couple of years since LCSF was passed. Um, and we have kept our eye on a sample of 40 school districts. We read their LCAPs the first year. We read them again the second year. We just published a report, and you can see a picture of that report on the page on the screen here called Puzzling Plans and Budgets. And what we tried to do in, in this research is make sense of the LCAPs, learn what they're telling us, identify uh, some additional needs or fixes from a policy or technical perspective that would, would help improve the LCAP process, but also identify opportunities to build local capacity and build capacity more broadly so that the LCAP and the LCFF process more generally is effective. The LCAP, of course, is just a document. It's the plan itself. What's most important is the process that goes into developing the plan. So that's the stakeholder engagement, that's the development of the priorities and goals for the district. That's the decision about how to invest resources and the plan for how to monitor whether those resources are being used in a way that's effective and will increase or improve uh, services and close opportunity and achievement gaps. But the, but, but the plan itself is an important artifact. So I'm going to talk for a few minutes about what we've learned from looking at LCAPs. And then from there, we'll transition into what we think this points to in terms of additional improvements to the LCAP as well as capacity building needs around the LCAP and the budget. So I'm going to talk about two things. One, the extent to which the LCAPs are transparent, and then I'll talk about supplemental and concentration funds. In regards to transparency, as you, for those of you who are engaged in the LCAP process in your communities know better, better than, even, than, than we do, these plans are really difficult to make sense of. Across our sample of 40 districts, we found that on average the plans tripled in size from the first year of LCAP to the second year, largely because of changes to the template. What we see is a lot of duplication of information and frankly a lot of cutting and pasting in some cases because it is a three-year plan. But one of the things that we found was particularly difficult in terms of making sense of the programs and services that were in the plans in some districts, not in all districts, but in many districts, is that it's not clear how much of the budget is accounted for. So we found that most districts account for less than half of their district's budget in their LCAP. Um, but it really, if you can keep stay on that side for just a minute, um, one point that I want to make there is that the, this ranged considerably across the state. So we found that in 17 of our 40 districts, only about a third of the budget was represented. Yet in seven districts, we found that over 100% of the budget showed up. Um, so, for example, we saw districts that included 
110% uh, of their budget. And this was often because they were double counting items in the LCAP for potentially justifiable reasons. But if you were to attempt to add up all the items, you would find that it didn't quite make sense And if you tried to compare it to the district's budget. So what this points to is the fact that the LCAP and the budget are not always well aligned, that the LCAP itself is not actually a budget, even though it contains some fiscal information. The next thing that we found is that there's a lot of confusion in looking across these plans around supplemental and concentration grants. Because of the way the information is reported, sometimes information is double counted, sometimes it's bundled into large, item, large line items that include multiple programs and services, it's impossible in many cases to tell whether the grants, um, the supplemental and concentration grants are being used to increase or improve services for high needs students. In some districts it's easier to see this, in some districts it's much more difficult. We did see some, some districts did a good job of showing exactly how they're going to use supplemental and concentration dollars separately from base dollars. And we found that to be a really helpful and important thing because it allowed us to see specifically what they're doing for low-income students, English learners, and foster youth. So for example, we saw some districts that said, we are using supplemental and concentration dollars specifically to, to hire bilingual counselors, bring on new case management for foster youth. Um, to build new offices devoted to African-American male achievement or to, to increase and improve services that are within existing departments. So one of the points that's important that we acknowledge here is that supplemental and concentration funds can be used to improve a service. They don't always have to be new programs or add-ons to the existing district budget. As Rob pointed out, there are huge competing cost pressures. So one of the things we're trying to um, look at is whether we're using supplemental and concentration funds to improve effectiveness and to increase the quality of services, not always to add new things. We also found cases where we saw supplemental and concentration dollars being used on services that raised question marks. Not to say that they were necessarily illegal, but we found things that caused us to wonder, will these incre increase or improve services? For instance, we saw districts using those dollars to um, increase salaries for all certificated personnel, um, even sometimes noting that that would be used to maintain or sustain existing services. So recognizing that it's just adding more money to the same service rather than improving or increasing that service. We also saw districts using um, the money in a way that seems like they're supplanting dollars. Uh, rather than supplementing services. So for instance, we saw some districts using these dollars for special education services or for English language services and translation services that have been provided by, that have been offered for years and are, um, that they are required to offer anyway, even before these dollars come in. The other thing that we noticed with supplemental and concentration dollars is that some districts are not spending all of them. Uh, at least they're not spending all of the, the dollars that they propose to, to spend. So one of the things we looked at is the annual update, and we looked at whether districts who said they were going to say spend a, a million dollars on a particular program actually reported back that they spent a million dollars on that service and found that in most cases districts are spending a little bit less than they had proposed. And often that may be for good reason. Yeah, admittedly, the annual update comes at a pretty poor time. The district has to report on the prior year program before the program is even completed or before they've closed their books for the year. So there's some timing elements that we can probably uh, uh, fix from a, a technical perspective. But even so, it raises questions for us and probably raises questions for, for you all who are engaged in communities about what the district plans to do with those dollars that it did not spend. And it, it does raise a question about whether we may be denying services to students, um, services that they're entitled to. Uh, so this is something that we know the legal community is looking at and it's something that we know advocates and communities are paying attention to as well. Now all of this is for districts that actually reported how they were using their supplemental and concentration dollars. Many districts are not reporting that in a, a clear, transparent way, making it very difficult to tell. Um, and they may be doing some really wonderful things. One of the things that I'll go back to is that the plan is not always a good reflection of what's happening on the ground and vice versa. And so we're trying to bring those into closer alignment with some of this work. Carrie, I'm sorry for interrupting you, but I thought another um, question that may be related to underspending is if a district does not spend those dollars within the school year, is it obligated to keep those dollars targeted the same way the following year, or what happens to those unspent dollars? 
We're not sure yet. That's a question that many of us across the state are raising. There's not a black and white answer to that. That's some gray space that I know the, the state board is trying to address, and I, uh, I think some of the legal community is trying to address that as well. We would say that the, those dollars are needing to be kind of earmarked as dollars for those same students in the out years, but I don't know that's a, a legal response. I'm going to um, transition it back to children now for a minute to talk about how this fits into the larger um, advocacy process and thinking about the budget timelines, and then we'll talk about some of the tools we're developing to build better connections between the LCAP and the budget. Yeah, thank you, Carrie. So as Carrie mentioned, we just kind of spent the first chunk of this webinar with uh, kind of research, the big picture, school context spending, and then some a great drill down on what we're seeing in LCAPs. Now we're going to talk about you know what do we do with this information? How do we move forward? I'm going to turn this back over to my colleague Rob Manwaring, and Rob's going to talk with you about uh, generally how do districts put their budgets together? What's the timeline, and uh, what have we been learning along the way here? So this slide attempts to send the signal that it's never too early to start engaging, and that oftentimes the biggest impact that you can have as an advocate is going to be in the fall and really what is what I would deem a pre pre planning sort of mode that districts go into so basically sometime during the fall district staff are trying to figure out what are their priorities for the next year they get some key information around November that gives them a sense of where's the economy headed and what are we likely to see in terms of education funding and so by November, they're already putting together pretty detailed plans on how they want to spend the money that they'll get the following fall, so almost a year ahead of time. And this is really where you probably have the biggest opportunity to have an impact is figuring out how to connect with district folks in that time frame. Obviously, the governor comes out with a budget in January, January 10. And that really kicks off the budget season and makes it more real. And so at that point, the local school boards are starting to develop what are we going to do with these additional resources? Are there new program requirements? And then obviously over the spring, they're, they're meeting with community groups in a very systematic way, um, but probably already have a good sense of what their plan is for these new resources, what their existing obligations are, what's left over and what opportunities that might create. And then late in the spring, obviously they're getting, which is happening right now, they're getting your specific feedback from community groups. And in May, um, this Friday, the governor will re-release an estimate of what the budget should look like for next year. And at that point, districts will finalize what their budgets are and then adopt them before the July 1 deadline. And then at that point, those plans are then reviewed. Uh, both the budgets are adopted by in July or in June, as well as the LCAPs. Um, but those are really finalizing a plan. And so our, our biggest message would be get in early and start to engage with those conversations before the district actually comes up with the plan. If you can help with that plan development and early thinking, you're going to have more influence than right now where they have a specific proposal and you're trying to get them to amend that proposal. So just to reiterate, one of our uh, one of our big messages that we want to send in this webinar regarding to influencing uh, school district budgets and LCFF is to start early and to get into the conversation early in the school year, and that by the time that the formal district budget hearings and the formal LCAP process, you know, and typically happens in May and June. That by then, uh, school districts typically have a uh, budget put together, and you're uh, in, you are in a position of having less influence than if you were to be in the conversation very early on. Okay, I'm going to be turning this back over to Education Trust West now, and they're going to be sharing with uh, with you all um, some of the tools we've been creating to help make budgets more transparent. Okay, great. Uh, so because of the challenges we've been hearing about the connection between the LCAP and the budget, and hearing that f folks on the ground want to engage more deeply in the budget, have questions about how the money is flowing, how the money is coming in, how it's being spent, and how it aligns with the LCAP, 
we've partnered with Children Now and with our friends at CASBO to develop a suite of tools that we think can support districts who are interested in finding uh, additional strategies for communicating with stakeholders or about their budgets, and also tools that could be leveraged by community-based organizations, parent leaders, and others who are engaged locally to seek out additional budget information from their districts. The idea here is that we want to show ways in which information can be communicated differently. The LCAP itself is is important but not sufficient when it comes to reporting the budget and the budget itself is hundreds of pages of state required reporting forms that are very difficult to make sense of there's something that probably exists in between there that includes presentations graphics other ways of communicating information about the budget that might be more accessible and actionable at the local level and so through some focus groups with parents students and uh, chief business officials in districts, we've put together a first set of tools. And I'm going to share with you one of them today. And you can find it on um, our website at edtrustwest.org. And you can see the full URL there. Um, in particular, we've created what, what we're calling an editable budget presentation. This is a PowerPoint slide template. It's really simple and straightforward. A PowerPoint that a, a district administrator could edit um, in a way that you, uses their own local data and make sense for their local community to present data in a way that can be consumed at a parent advisory committee meeting or a public hearing or any other public meeting um, in order to present their budget information in a way that aligns it with the LCAP and the, the priorities of the district. The PowerPoint itself is about 20 slides long. Uh, it, I'm going to show you a few of those slides just so you have a sense of what's in there. The first one looks at the general fiscal trends for the district. So as, as Rob laid out, it's really important to understand the fiscal health of the district and the, the context in which it's sitting. So are revenues going up or down? Um, how much new revenue are we getting this year? And generally, where does that revenue come from? Is it mostly LCFF dollars? The answer is yes for, for every district. Um, and importantly, the bulk of that money from LCFF is base funding not supplemental and concentration funding. And while supplemental and concentration funding is enormously important, the vast majority of the instructional program and the supports and services that are offered to students really do come from base dollars. So we think it's important that the conversation be oriented around the full LCFF pot, not just the supplemental and concentration dollars. And of course, there's additional state funding and additional federal dollars like Title I and Title III that still come in. So this is a sample slide that a district could use to show that revenue pattern. And then the next slide shows the, um, the breakdown of new revenue. So of the increase that the district is getting this year over last year, where is that money coming from? And again, most of it's LCFF-based dollars, although in this case, $3 million is supplemental and concentration dollars. So that allows the, the community to orient the conversation around new revenues and think about what it could do with those new dollars. At the same time, there are ongoing commitments that the district has even before it considers what it wants to do differently. And the next slide kind of brings us back to the where Rob started us, which is there are fiscal pressures that a district faces even before it engages in a conversation about programs and services. So in this example district that is receiving roughly $17 million in new revenue, there are salary increases that it, it cannot control because they're step and column, unless of course it wishes to revisit its step and column policy, which is another tact. Um, there are negotiated salary increases, there are increases in health benefits and pensions, which we know are rising rapidly in California. And then there's also a required class size reduction that came um, under LCFF for the early grades. So in this example district, a very typical district, you can see that even before it can think about what it wants to do differently, it's going to lop $6 million off that $17 million in new revenue, leaving only you know, less than $11 million to play with. And we have seen examples of districts already using these slides and have seen that in some districts, actually that increase in revenue um, is almost fully taken up by those increased commitments, particularly the rise in pension benefits. So 
this is a way in which the district can ground the community in kind of a discussion about ongoing commitments before shifting to new revenues. And then it also potentially prompts a question about what we can do differently with our existing program. So there are ways to increase or improve services that don't mean adding new people or new programs, but rethinking what we do with existing time, staff, um, and services. So that's something that we hope that this kind of data can, um, a conversation that this data can prompt. I didn't include additional slides from the, the deck in here because I didn't want to spend too much time on this, but the next slides that you would see if you were to go to our website include things that show how the district is spending its new revenue, what its proposed programs and services are, and how those relate to the district's goals and the eight state priorities. And it also includes slides that show how the district can break out base versus supplemental and concentration dollars. So it's very clear how specifically the district plans to spend those supplemental dollars for targeted services. Uh, we've only had this, this set of slides out in the world for a few weeks now. Uh, we really have targeted district leaders as a primary audience and hope that they will find some things useful in here and edit and modify this in a way that um, makes sense for them as they go out into their communities. But we also think there's a huge opportunity for community advocates to take this to their district and say, can you do something like this? Can you give us this data? Or can you answer questions in a way that, that presents the data um, in this way? Because we're not getting it through what we currently have. So we're hoping that it sets the table for a dialogue between community advocates and stakeholders and the district to come to a place of shared understanding about their budget and their LCAP. Yeah, Carrie, yeah. just to um, maybe state this a different way, so a parent or a community group could take this slide deck and bring it to the district and ask the district to, if they would consider presenting their budget information in this using th these kinds of formats and, you know, these slides as an example. And in doing that, a parent or community group We'll be able to see these competing pressures. We'll be able to see the big picture of base and supplemental concentration. Is that a fair restatement just to bring emphasis to the point? Absolutely. Thanks. Yeah, and I'm going to transition this to my colleague Raquel, who is going to talk about how these tools and this information bridges into advocacy strategies. Thanks, Carrie. So we know many of you are having these conversations with your districts right now um, about both budgets and the LCAP process. And earlier, Carrie covered um, the challenges of the LCAP um, and the policy and technical fixes for those challenges, which we're, we both, Children Now and at Trust West, are working on. But until those issues are fixed, um, both our budget engagement toolkit and um, what we'll be covering in the next two slides our, our, our attempt to help advocates uh, work with what we got, um, essentially, and still be effective in the LCAP process um, despite these challenges. Um, so as you engage the district in the LCAP and budget process, um, here are some questions that we think um, could be useful and uh, to keep in mind as you have um, this dialogue with your district. And again, as Carrie mentioned, um, in, in uh, trying to reach a shared understanding between uh, the district's limitations, um, the pot of dollars that they have to work with, and what the community thinks um, these investments should be uh, directed towards. So what are, what are the district's spending priorities? It's very straightforward. A district should be able to tell the community um, where it plans to prioritize its LCFF base and supplemental and concentration fund. Um, and as Carrie mentioned earlier, that although these priorities should be reflected in a district's LCAP, it's not always clear because of the challenges with the LCAP template. So this is why it's important for advocates to speak up and ask questions about a district spending priority. And this is why, again, um, the toolkit that we provided um, allows the districts to um, better communicate um, those priorities, and not only those priorities, but the limitations and what they're working with. How will the spending plan help close opportunity and achievement gaps. Many of us championed LCFF because we believe it holds the promise of closing opportunity and achievement gaps by directing targeted resources uh, to districts so that they can better serve high-need students, those students who are often left behind. And because LCFF leaves these decisions at the local level, um, districts with input 
from parents and communities can decide how best to serve these vulnerable students with their budget. So um, ensuring that we are looking at what targeted programs and services will close opportunity and, and achievement gaps allows the opportunity to advocate uh, for that and, and ensure that the spending plan matches that goal. How have districts been spending supplemental and concentration fund and how will it spend it in the future? Um, again, as you know, supplemental and concentration funds are targeted resources um, that are directed to districts to serve these high need students and these resources should be targeted to these students and as advocates we need to ask the district how these extra dollars are reaching um, or these these targeted dollars are reaching our most vulnerable students um, not only in the current year but again um, as the LCAP reflects the three-year plan how in subsequent years um, th they plan to do that many of you who are engaged in the LCAP process know that the section there's section three of the LCAP, um, which asks districts to provide an overview of how they plan to use supplemental and concentration funds as a whole. Um, and uh, I think Carrie mentioned earlier that um, although a district doesn't need to delineate the spending of supplemental and concentration funds in the LCAP, um, it could be something that um, advocates can request their school districts to do um, even though it's, it's not required by law. Um, an example um, is uh, we are working in San Bernardino County and an analysis of the 33 districts there revealed that um, uh, seven, approximately seven uh, school districts actually delineate, delineate their supplemental and concentration fund in their LCAP even though it's not required by law. And so advocates in school districts that don't do that are making a formal request for um, their district to, uh, in goodwill, um, increase transparency um, by, by doing that. Because clearly if the other school districts can do it, um, that school district can too. Um, and then, of course, how will supplemental and concentration spending increase or improve services? Again, um, the, the targeted resources advocates uh, are, should be interested and, 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 and asking the districts um, about, um, about how these, these dollars uh, will be spent to increase and improve services for our most vulnerable students. He, as I mentioned earlier, at Trust West has been working with advocates um, across the state, specifically through our community data and research hub in San Bernardino County. Um, I wanted to share some strategies that we've seen be helpful to advocates as they engage in the LCAP budget. Uh, the LCAP and budget process. It's been interesting to um, learn. We've we've uh, definitely been um, learning a lot from our work in San Bernardino with the advocates there. These are a few of the takeaways based on the community dialogue we've been having with them. So I hope it's it's useful for you all. Um, one of the advocacy strategies that um, we've shared with a lot of the advocates, and this came out of the fact that many of the advocates were feeling a bit frustrated that they would provide input to the district about the LCAP and they felt they had they didn't have any recourse when their input was not reflected in the LCAP. Um, we explained to them that LCFF law says that districts must have a parent advisory group committee um, and the superintendent must present the draft LCAP to the, to the parent advisory group and they must, they, the district, must respond in writing to any comments from the parent advisory group on the draft LCAP. So we said, find a friend on the parent advisory group. Um, work through the parent advisory group to funnel your input through them because um, if that input is not taken by law, um, the district must reply in writing. Build board champions. Um, we, Since most of the engagement happens with district administrators, we often forget that um, board members can be our allies in the LCAP and budget advocacy. They um, uh, can uh, demand um, that uh, their administrators um, uh, adopt some of these transparency um, best practices. Um, as a matter of fact, um, at Trust West, in addition to the tools that Carrie presented, um, uh, created a board resolution. Um, for school board members to um, uh, 
uh, pass at the school board level and, and publicly express their commitment to uh, a, a more open and transparent budget engagement process. So, um, and again, in San Bernardino, what we've seen is that our uh, equity-minded school board members have been um, our best allies there. Uh, finally, the same thing with the County Office of Ed. Um, are, they can be allies and champions uh, in San Bernardino specifically. Again, they are a, a county with 33 school districts. Um, at the county level, there are LCAP program managers that uh, serve as technical assistant and advisors to um, the school districts in the county. So engaging them and letting them know um, how it's going, um, as well as working with your County Office of Ed trustees um, who can encourage um, and possibly exert some influence. We often forget that we can also uh, work through our County Office of Ed trustee who represents larger areas. Um, and lastly, show a district what's possible. Ask the district for, um, again, Carrie walked us through our, our budget template. Um, ask the district to use it, as well as share examples of promising practices from other districts. I explained earlier about how um, we shared with some of the districts what other districts in San Bernardino County are doing to say, hey, it is possible, they're doing it. Um, also, um, best practices around a more community-friendly budget, that's uh, another ask that our San Bernardino advocates are doing with school districts where they've shown um, districts in Sacramento and in Fresno um, have a more community-friendly uh, uh, appendix or, or, or template uh, that shows the LCAP, a summary that shows the LCAP in a more community-friendly way. So um, these are a few of the strategies that um, are working in San Bernardino, and we hope that uh, they'll work for you all. Thank Great. You. Thank you, Raquel. Raquel. Uh, we're going to head towards wrapping up now. I'm going to turn it back over to Rob, and Rob will just give you a quick look at what's on the horizon uh, with LCFF and, uh, and school accountability. Sure. So. Uh, a couple things coming up. Uh, so actually, right now, today, the State Board of Education is discussing, or will discuss revisions to the LCAP template. Actually, I correct you. Uh, that'll be to, at their tomorrow board meeting. So they're meeting today and tomorrow in, San, in, in Sacramento. Um, so tomorrow, they'll be talking about revising the template uh, tool, trying to streamline it, make it a multi-year document, also possibly adding an executive summary. Uh, in that uh, discussion, we'll be pushing for better fiscal transparency to explain some of the things that Carrie and I have been talking about today. Um, a second major element is there will be um, an evaluation rubric, which is really the accountability arm of this whole LCAP and LCFF process. Uh, and that's a big debate going on as far as what are the elements that we're going to use to hold schools accountable. Um, whether how far we move beyond just test scores, there's discussion of things like chronic absenteeism, uh, school climate measures, student suspension rates, college and career readiness indicators, and those sort of things going in play. Also, uh, Children Now is running legislation related to that and being more explicit about some of those measures that we'd like to see included around climate uh, and, and engagement and access, uh, things like parent-teacher surveys being included, and that bill is AB 2548, and it is sitting in the Assembly Appropriations Committee waiting to be acted upon. Uh, and finally, we'll be uh, taking this budget and transparency work to the next level and over the summer creating a more deeper set of tools that, that we would like to see districts use in the fall to really explain so all right, we're three years into this thing. What has happened? What, what have we done with all this new resources? Um, you know, in, in many districts, it's 25, 30, 40 percent increases that they've seen over the last three to four budgets. What investments have they made? And, and what are their course moving forward? So those are some of the things that are coming soon. Great. Thanks, Rob. Okay, we're going to move over now and, and respond to a few of the questions that have been coming in. Um, we have a few minutes here. One question that came in had to do with uh, examples of districts that have included early learning in their LCAPs. And um, here at Children Now, we have been uh, spending a good amount of time on early learning and LCFF, and we do have a 
those examples. So if you would like to get in touch with me, uh, Jim Ketty at Children Now, I'm happy to help uh, send you that information and talk more about early learning and LCFF. We also got a qu couple questions on the unspent money, uh, unspent dollars in, the, in, in LCFF. And Carrie, I'm gonna send these your way right now. So one question was, does the unspent money just go back to the state? And another question was, is it possible for uh, you know parents, community groups to see uh, where the spending is on target and where the unspent dollars are when you look at an LCAP? Okay, no, the dollars do not go back to the state. They stay with the school district. They roll back into the general fund and the district can decide what to do with them the following year. Um, the community can look at the annual update section of the LCAP to see how the district, you know, they're, they're asked to describe the services and the spending they provided relative to what they proposed the prior year and reflect upon how well it worked and what they might want to change. So that's one place to start. But to get deeper, you probably have to ask more specific questions of, of the district. Great. Thanks, Carrie. Um, Rob, here's one for you. Um, can you explain the role of LCFF and LCAP in school districts that receive basic aid? Sure. So, so just like a typical district, basic aid districts will have a portion of their funding that is supplemental in concentration. Um, their calculation won't be driven by the same gap closure type of thing that I discussed where basically half of your remaining gap will be closed. It'll be driven by local factors. It'll be driven by changes in your local property tax base. So really your, your revenues will depend upon what's happening with local housing markets and things like that as far as the total size of the pot. But the planning process uh, directly mirrors. So, so the LCAPs should be going through a similar rhythm, discussing what portion of their monies are specifically allocated for supplemental and concentration type activities. Great. Thanks, and, Rob. Jim, Jim, if I can add into that, the, the important thing to know is that the LCAP is not just for supplemental and concentration dollars, and it's not just for high poverty districts. It's for all districts, regardless of how many low income EL or foster youth they have. And the plan itself is supposed to address the eight state priorities and the plan for the core academic program. So we, we've seen some districts treat it as just a plan for students in poverty, and that's actually not the case. It's something that applies to everybody. Great. Yeah, thank you, Carrie. Very important point. Carrie, here's another one for you, um, given the research you've all been doing on LCAPs, which is, have you noticed school districts aligning their budgets with LCAPs so that there isn't confusion, or aligning their budgets with LCAPs to hold themselves better, uh, more accountable to what they are putting in their plans? We're trying to find examples of that. We've heard that there's some districts that are modifying their accounting structure to better align with the LCAP, and we've heard, um, so Santa Ana Unified is one that I've heard of that is working on that, but we haven't had a chance to look at it yet. Rob, here's one for you. There's been a question about declining enrollment, and uh, what are some of the factors that contribute to declining enrollment, and uh, what does that mean for districts? Well, so, so there's, Two main dynamics that are often going on with declining enrollment. One is just simply demographics. Some parts of the state is growing and other parts aren't. Uh, oftentimes it's coastal communities are, are seeing declines and more inland empire type areas are, are seeing growth. Um, it, you know, that can have a myriad of factors that, that drive it. Really what's important is how well does the district know it's coming? And are they able to adjust their budgets to stay in front of it? And really that's, that's where good, good district planning and budgeting will come in. Um, they'll have to adjust over time their staffing levels and in some situations they may have to adjust where their schools are located. Because often even within a district, you know, the east side of the district is growing while the west side is declining enrollments and how they adjust to that um, are, are key factors that you need to keep an eye on. Yeah, and let me just add from having seen and engaged in parent organizing in districts with declining enrollment, declining enrollment is brutal, and if uh, it's definitely something to be paying attention to if you're in one of those districts because it, it has a huge impact on a district's budget and it often leads to 
questions around school closures and just it's a very very difficult context to be in yeah well I think we've reached the end of our time and what I'd like to do just in terms of any final comments is invite Carrie or Raquel or both from Education Trust West with any other final thoughts on advocacy and what were you know what people what we were hoping people would take away from uh, from the uh, webinar this is Carrie I think that what we would love to hear is what the existing or what the the continuing needs and gaps are in local communities and how we can better support those. We, the budget tools are our first attempt to get some information out there and some templates and tools that can help with the alignment between the budget and the LCAP. But if people have seen best practices or promising practices or examples they'd like us to learn from, please send them our way and let us know how, what additional capacity building um, support groups like ours can provide or ways in which you all can support each other. Uh, Rob, any any other uh, words of uh, advice from you or other, other things you think folks should be uh, paying attention to as they look at budgets? Well, I mean, my biggest message would be make sure you get out and vote and spread the word about reauthorizing Prop 30 because that's going to be a critical step moving forward in, in keeping funding flowing and programs growing instead of shrinking. Yep, that again is going to be on the ballot this November. It's a, a, a it's a tax on high income earners, and it generates a few billion dollars of additional revenue for our schools. And as we started off in the webinar, and I think uh, I think people are generally aware of, California is 42nd in the nation in school spending. We've got a long way to go to do right by our kids. We've made progress with LCFF, and I think we're making gradual progress toward equity. Certainly not at the pace any of us would like, but uh, we uh, we uh, ne really need to be uh, sticking together and continuing to doing this great work. Okay, so next steps, we'll be sending out materials to all of you who joined us on the call with links to these different documents. We'll also send out some contact information for those of us uh, who've been uh, your presenters. So if you want to do any, any questions we didn't get to, uh, my apologies, but we are happy, to, I'm happy to follow up on any questions that you send me directly. We'll post the webinar on our Children Now YouTube uh, channel, and then uh, we'll be organizing a, a next webinar to go deeper on budget transparency at the beginning of the school year in the fall as a way to help uh, prepare folks to enter into kind of the next uh, school year and the next phase of advocacy. So thanks very much, everyone. I particularly want to thank uh, our partners at Education Trust West and all the terrific work that they've been doing uh, for joining us. Okay, thanks much. Bye-bye.